test. Only problem is I gave you the wrong test. So just pick up Romans 5 and read verse, verse 9 and 10 and move right on. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we'll follow up last Sunday's message with uh, on the judgment with a message on the Wrath of God. Not a subject that's uh, very pleasant to think about, but one we need to think about. And so let's, uh, let's bow for prayer. My Father in heaven, I feel like I can see heaven from right here. Heaven came down in glory, filled my soul. There at the cross, Jesus. So, Father, today there's something that takes place in this assembly that is unique, invisible, yet powerful. For your spirit walks in the midst of the church. So, Father, today as we have this message, may it not be for our neighbor, the person to my left or right, but be for me. Us, Father, to come face to face with this, this subject. <clears throat> that your wrath is no small thing. Without Jesus, we're in trouble. Father, in this hour, impress upon us the seriousness of life. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Skeptics like to poke fun at the Bible. And there are many stories that they poke fun at. The biggest one of all, you know what it is. Which one is it? Right. Story of Jonah and the way. Did you see on the news where archaeologists found the, the fossil of a whale in the Mediterranean Sea? And when they examined it on a microscope, it had embedded in it the hair of a Hebrew man? Did you see that on the news? No, no you didn't. Was it wasn't on the news. <laughs> <laughs> That's not <laughs> But skeptics <clears throat> like to point out that there's no way possible for a man to live for three days in the belly of a whale. Well, first of all, the Bible doesn't say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It says that God prepared great fish. And it swallowed up Jonah. I got to thinking about that. Maybe the inside of that great fish was like the inside of a submarine. <laughs> Jesus believed in the story of Jonah. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus believed all the stories in the Bible that men poke fun at. I'll stick with Jesus. How about you? Absolutely. Another one of this, the story of the flood. And again, skeptics have all kinds of reasons why it's not possible for Noah and his wife and sons, Shem and Jacob, their three wives, to gather all the animals of the earth and clean two unto uh, seven. 
and live on a boat for over a year. How do you feed all those animals? How do you water? What about, what about, what about the waste? Well, there, there are answers to all those things. But skeptics like to poke fun at the story of the worldwide flood. However, did you know that marine, marine fossils, aquatic fossils, have been found on Mount Everest? Mount Everest. The tallest mountain in the world, over 29,000 feet. It is a historic fact that marine aquatic fossils have been found on Mount Everest. You know why? Because, because there was a day when Mount Everest was underwater. <clears throat> Jesus believed that. He said, in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the day Noah was taken the ark, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus believed in the story of Jonah. He believed in the story of the great flood. Two, two great stories that men like to poke fun at. But there's another one that men like to poke fun at, and that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 19, 24, 25 and 28 says, The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord of heaven. He overthrew those cities in the valley of all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley he saw. Behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Wouldn't that have been a sight to see? The Gay people of Sanctum Sodom and Gomorrah were having a gay old time. But that was offensive to the God of heaven. And the Lord said, I can find 50, 40, 30, 20, 25, 10 righteous men. He couldn't find 10. And he told Lot, King James, get, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Lot, wife, daughter-in-law left, and God pulverized Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the Sodom and Gomorrah were in the vicinity of the Dead Sea, also known as the Salt Sea. The most brackish water, body of water on the face of the earth is the Dead Sea. Over 1,300 feet low sea level. They say anybody can float in the Dead Sea. I, I want to try sometime. Whenever I try to float in a pool, I float like a rock straight to the bottom. <laughs> but the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, is over 1,300 feet below sea level, the lowest point on the face of the earth. Maybe it's that low because that's where God lived in Memorial. They drove those evil cities into the ground. Those are three stories, all true, because Jesus also believed that story when he said, remember Lot's wife. Jesus believed all the stories, already said that, that are really good in the Word of God. I'll stick with Jesus, not the skeptics. How about you? Absolutely. So, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is one that references our subject today, which is the wrath of God. The wrath of God may not be a subject that we like to think about, but we need to think about it for four reasons. Number one, it is real. Number two, the Bible speaks about it all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Number three, it's rarely talked about. And number four, we're going to face it if we're not in Christ. Maybe everybody here today is in Christ, and maybe, maybe not. But let us be reminded today, and we'll, we'll get to the good news after, after, after a while. Let's know three truths about the wrath of God. First of all, the wrath of God is an expression of the Holiness of God. Say, holiness. Holiness. If I were to ask you, if you were to ask the average person, fill in the blank, like on Jeffrey, fill in the blank. God is well, because of we just referenced the term. You said holy. God is. But what would the average person say? Love. God is love. 
Is that right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I think the average person will say, God is love. And, and, and God is love. But God is also holy. And that means this God is, is sinless, perfect, morally pure, without flaw, without fault. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4. This is a comparative text to Isaiah 6, but Revelation 4 8 says, The four living creatures, each one of them having six wings and full of eyes around and within, day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy. We sang that song today. Holy, right here, we just sang the song. You are holy, right? The Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. That's the only phrase in the Bible that is repeated three times in reference to God. It means God is holy. Holier. Holiest. We say like good, better, and best. best. God is holy. Holier. Holier. In the Hebrew, which the Old Testament the Hebrew, this is a book of Old Testament, to say something three times is to say to the maximum. You can't get any more holy. And in heaven, the heavenly beings, wouldn't they be something to see? Six winged creatures, they, 24 hours a day, if you will, they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I, I, I plan on seeing that. How about you? Hebrews, not Hebrews, Psalm 92, verse 15 says, To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. That's just another way of saying what? God is holy. Holy, pure, perfect, sinless, without fault, morally blameless. Here's one more. Habakkuk 1, 13 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. Yeah, that's where the wrath of God comes from. As we'll get into we unpack this message here this morning. People, people make a terrific mistake. When they think God is just like us. Now, in some kind of way, we're like God and made us in His image. You know what the Bible says? We're made in His image. And, and so I don't know what all that means, but I know this. God's not like us. God is God is eternal. We're not. We have a beginning. God is spirit. We're, we're flesh and blood and spirit also. God is sinless. We're not. But the average person, many people think that God is like a grandpa in the sky, half asleep, half awake, watching the world go by, and, and when people die, he welcomes everybody to heaven. Come on in. One Hollywood actor said, pray to God for forgiveness. He'll forgive you. After all, that's his job. Close, close. Most preachers have been sent something that goes like this. Email's not popular like it was 20, 25 years ago. But this was a popular email that was running around the country. God's like Coke. He's the real thing. God's like Tide. He gets the stains out. God's like Scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. God's like Allstate. You're in good hands with him. God's like the energy of money. He just keeps on going and going and going. God's like out and self Flop, flop, this, this, oh, what a relief he is. I, I'm here to tell you today, that is a mistake. Don't compare God to Scott's tape. God's not like Scott's tape, coat, tie, out, stuff, in the dark, 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 we try to describe God in the kind of way. You see, God's wrath is his deserved anger that is aroused and is ignited when his holiness is violated by our sin will be dead. God's anger, God's wrath rather, is his righteous anger, deserved, it's, 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 it's right, <coughs> when our sin violates his holiness, our sin offends him, it is like an attack, it's like taking an ice pick in Stabbing God right heart. That's what sin is. It's an attack on God's character. And when we sit in God's wrath, is aroused. It is, it is incited. It 
flares up, if you will. For example, speaking of Israel, the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 5, and verse 24 and 5 says of Israel, oh, they rejected the law of the Lord Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? And despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Notice what God's called there. On, account, on this account, of the anger of the Lord is burned against his people. What followed the word holy? What, what, what aspect of God? Holy one of Israel, what's next? The anger of the Lord. Burned against his people, and he stretched out his hand against them, struck them down. The mountains quaked, the corpses lay like refuse in built streets. For all his anger is not spent, but his hand is still stretched out. Why did God do that? Because Israel determined to worship an idol. That's why. And that's what God did to them. Their idolatry violated his holiness, and there's a consequence for that. And he turned on them in his anger, and he smoked many of them. The rest went off to captivity. One more. Joshua 24, 19 and 20. I predict this text. And Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord for He's a holy God. Notice that. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. God's jealousy flows out of His holiness. So does His wrath. You will not forgive your transgressions or your sin. Why not? If you forsake the Lord to serve foreign gods, He will return and do you harm and consume you after He has done good to you. Notice that. God will harm you. You do what? You forsake him for foreign gods. And Israel served foreign gods, you bet they did. And God forsook them. He gave them a writ of divorce, the Bible says. He divorced them in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. So sin is an attack on God's holiness. It's a violation of his law. It arouses his wrath. The wrath of God flows out of the holiness of God. It's an extension of his offended holiness. Number two. Wrath of God punishes unrepentant sinners. Wrath of God punishes unrepentant sinners. We're going to get to the good news after this. Not yet. I don't need this message. Preacher, I don't need this message. I'm already a Christian. You do need this message because you know people who aren't Christians. That's what, that's what you know people who aren't Christians. God's wrath is expressed upon people who refuse to repent of their sins, therefore are a candidate for his offended holiness, which is his wrath. I, when I was a kid, I heard this. Moscow has missiles aimed toward Washington. Washington has missiles aimed toward Moscow. true or not. Some of you may know it's true. I don't know whether that's true or not. But I know this. When a child is born, that beautiful little baby is at peace with God. They don't have any sin, contrary to what Romanism and Lutheranism says. They're, they're wrong. That baby doesn't have any sin. But there comes a time when that kid that the parents want to walk and talk, they wish he'd sit down and shut up. And, and that kid eventually breaks God's law. And I don't know what age it is, age of accountability, it might be six, seven, eight, and that never died. It's not the same very person. But when that child sins, he's no longer at peace with God. And God's wrath is like a business. God's wrath works up. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't blow him up. But if that kid goes through his life, pile up sin, 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 and is never forgiven, eventually God will launch the wrath missile. And it will catch that person at death. And they'll have to suffer the consequences of offending God's holiness. Said, when we sin, God doesn't step up on us. Isn't that great? We heard testimony about that last week in right now here at Fresh Jumping. We sin, God doesn't, God, God doesn't give up on us. He pursues us. He, listen, friend, He's pursuing you today. 
He's reaching out to you today right here. He's pursuing you. But if we continue to reject and spurn him, eventually that love of God will prosecute us. And that wrath of God rather, will prosecute us and it will punish us. Let me give you some examples before we get to the good news. God destroying unrepentant sinners. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of his heart, thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. Sounds like a 6 o'clock news, doesn't it? <laughs> the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created. From the face of the earth, from man to animals to creepy things, the birds of the sky, I'm sorry that I made them. Genesis 6, 5 to 7. We've already referenced that the flood. God's wrath was unleashed in a worldwide flood. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And his wife and his three sons and every wife. But, but the flood is an example of God unleashing his wrath on the world. You see, the wheels of God's justice grind slowly, but they do grind finally and eventually. The consequences are shot. We've already mentioned this example of you next as well, Jude verse 7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah, the surrounding towns, gave themselves up to sexual immorality, perversion. Certainly, it's an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. If you're looking for a verse in the Bible to, to tell you that uh, homosexuality is, is unacceptable to God, there it is, right there. There it is. You see, it is true, it is true in America that gays have rights, but it's not right to be gay. Gays have rights. All the rights that we have, we rightly so. But it's not right to be gay. I didn't make that up. That's how God feels about that. I was in a home one time, they said to me, 25 years ago, you shouldn't say that about that subject because I have friends that are homosexual. Is, is there anybody here that has any friends that are homosexual? I know homosexual people. Okay? Most people are homosexual people. But this is how God feels. And his wrath was unleashed upon Sodom and Gomorrah drove those perverted cities into the good ground. Here's one more example. Interesting one. A man told me this past week, he said, this book is full of fables. Well, it doesn't read like it. Doesn't read like it, I'll say. Doesn't read like Grimm's fairy tales. Maybe you think this is a fable. Maybe he does. Acts 12, 21 through 23 says, On the appointed day, Herod had to put on his royal apparel. Herod was king. I think it's Herod the Ripper II. Took his seat on the rostrum. Began delivering an address to the audience. People kept crying out, the voice of a God and not a man. Can you imagine being given a lecture and, and your, 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 your country, country, your audience shout out, you're a God, not a man. No. Make you feel good. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. He did not give glory to God. He was eaten by one and then he died. Let me tell you something. There's a book called The Works of Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus tells that story. He was not a Christian. He was a Jew who defected from Judaism when the, when the pressure from Rome came down. He just, he just came into the world. Flavius Josephus. He actually says that Herod lingered on for several days and then he should die. The Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible is right. So maybe you're thinking, I always thought God's a God of love. And you're telling me that God is a God of wrath. Isn't that a contradiction, preacher? No, it's not. Let me illustrate it this way. Some of you heard me before. Won't you picture me one 
whole train track on this stage. What direction is that? Anybody know? West. Okay, west. All right. We have a train coming from the west. Coming this way. We have a train. It's supposed to be east then. A train coming from the east. This way. And the center is standing on the tracks. That train coming this way. That train coming this way. This is the love of God train. This is the wholeness of God train. One side note. Story of my family in the late 1920s. My great uncle was standing on a train track. Saw a train coming. He stepped off the track on this track and the train coming this direction and killed him. Killed him. My great uncle won. He was a Christian. So, as this sinner lives his life, the love of God train is moving towards him slowly. The holiness of God train is moving towards him slowly. He's living life. He has a chance in this life to get on the love of God train. Ride that train all the way to heaven. That black train that you talk about, that song, that old black train. He can get on that train. But if he does not, those two trains get closer and closer and closer to that center. Here's what happens. Eventually, the love of God train switches off the track to another track. And the holiness of God train runs over the center. And connected to the holiness of God train are some cars. The second car is the wrath of God train. And the third car is the jealousy of God train. Because God's wrath and his jealousy flow out of his holiness. That's how God can be love and holiness at the same time. We have a chance to get on the love of God train. But if we don't, God's holiness and his justice, his, his righteous anger toward us, will deal with us. And that's why these two scriptures are very important. Hebrews 10.31. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son, the wrath of God abides on him. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. I left part of it out. The wrath of God abides on him. You understand that? Put that in your neck. The wrath of God abides on that person who does not obey the Son. Who's the Son? Jesus. Jesus. That brings us to Now we have all that to get to the good news. Number three. This is the good news. The wrath of God was appeased by Jesus on the cross. This may be the most important statement I'm going to make today. I don't know. The wrath of God will either catch you at the cross or will catch you at death. The wrath of God will either catch you at the cross or it will catch you at death. That's why Paul said in Romans 5, 9, Having been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath of God through him. Romans 5 9. To be justified, what does that mean? It means, it means that God treats us just as if we had never sinned. Even though we have, it, the, the idea behind that text is there's no penalty for you. Even though you're rotten, filthy, vile sinner, God treats us as if we had never sinned. Why? Because of Jesus, his sacrifice of peace. Wrath of God. There's a very big word in the New Testament. It's not used, it's not used in society, but it, it, it is understood as the word propitiation. Say, say propitiation. Propitiation. 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means a sacrifice that turns away wrath. Dead now quickly. Don't be Brian. Go to the helicopter. Just want to go make it. In the early 2000s, as a young man, he had a rape charge against him in Colorado. He never went to court out as a liberal or they press charges. But he was married at the time. Kobe Bryant bought his wife, Vanessa, a diamond ring that cost several million dollars. 
Do you see, do you see what he's saying? He's saying God's wrath is like that volcano that he always has that hot magma there, but every now and then it blows up. It blew up in the flood. It blew up in Sodom and Korah. It blew up on Korah. If you remember Korah and his 250 men, though, the ground opened up and swallowed them alive. It blew up on Israel. It blew up on Herod. One day it'll blow up again on the world. Now I want to show you a picture. Tell me what that's a picture of. I'll tell you how to show you. Exactly right. That's Mount St. Helens. Where's that going to be? In Nebraska? I know. It's probably in Washington. I took that picture. Logan Caleb and I were there four years ago this August. How far do you think the visitor center is where we were standing? How far do you think it is to that mountain visitor center? Let take a guess. 50 miles. Anybody else? From where I took that picture of the mountain. Come on. Four miles. Four miles. That's all. The visitor center is four miles from now. It's been, the picture has been shrunk to get to fit on that. Look, I'm looking at that screen. It looks better on that screen. <laughs> that screen becomes a picture of that screen. All right. I was a freshman in high school. On uh, May the 18th, 1980. Forty years ago, last month, at 8.32 in the morning, on a Sunday, that mountain blew up. Before that, there was an earthquake, and the whole north face of that mountain slid off. And then it went boom. There was a man named Harry Truman, not Harry S. Truman, but President Harry R. Truman, who ran a lodge five miles north of the mountain, his spirit left. He was 82 years old, but 83. They tried to get him to leave his, his, his daughter, daughter from South Carolina, his sister, rather, from South Carolina. South Carolina. She played with him to leave. Harry said, minus a few cuss words, ain't nobody knows this not better than me. She don't dare blow up on me. The mountain blew up. It was covered with Harry Truman and his 16 cats. And the lodge of Spirit Lake is 600 feet above that giant new grave. And he was ushered into the presence of Jesus immediately. I said that to say this. Revelation chapter 6 depicts the second coming of Jesus. And this is what it says. And the kings of the earth and the princes, the generals, the rich and the mighty, and everyone else, both slain and free, be hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountain and the mountains. He called to the mountains and the rocks, and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. From the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who? serious time. This isn't a time to be thinking about lunch. 
come and accept Jesus, His righteousness, and His righteousness applied to your soul so that you can be saved from that event. And we all may die before that event happens, but it's six one, half a dozen the other. Will you please stand? I've already told how to be saved. If you've never been baptized the Bible way,